Hi everyone, let's take a look at the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation was the first government established in the newly formed United States of America. We had the Treaty of Paris in 1783 marking the end of the Revolutionary War and Britain acknowledging the United States as a country. Next step was to form a government. Many people think we went right into the Constitution and Bill of Rights following the war, but no. George Washington had retired to his favorite place, Mount Vernon, and the rest of the colonies were left with deciding how to form a new government. Fortunately, during the Revolutionary War, the Second Continental Congress had been drafting a government that the colonies would adopt, assuming they were victorious. See, constitutions or documents outlining a style of government were really trendy in America at the time. No other countries really did this, but it was all the rage in the colonies prior to and throughout the war. So the Articles of Confederation were written with a number of things in mind, but the most important element was a fear of another monarchy arising in the U.S. In many ways, the U.S. wanted to go as far in the other direction of an English monarchy-style government as they could. In that same vein, the Articles of Confederation really promoted the power of states' rights. The central government had very limited power in the Articles of Confederation, while each state essentially acted as their own country. That's where the name of the document comes into play. A confederation is really just a loose union of sovereign states. They were ratified by all states on March 1st, 1781. The supreme power went to the states and the legislative body. There was no executive branch, and the judicial branch had very limited powers. For a law to be passed, each state had one vote. Nine out of 13 states had to vote yes for a law to become enacted. Most damagingly, the National Congress had no way of raising money to pay for an army, build roads, or offer services. All it could do was request money from the states. Not surprisingly, states would rarely hand over money to a national government when requested. As such, states were left to their own to create rules, taxes, and militias. The young United States was open to attack because they barely had a standing military and each state was acting individually. Things were not looking good. Soon, the Barbary pirates off the coast of North Africa began to attack American merchants trading in the Mediterranean. Without a navy, the U.S. couldn't do anything to stop it. Moreover, Britain was still hassling the United States on the high seas, too. Alexander Hamilton, George Washington's top aide, became convinced that a strong central government was necessary to balance out the legislative power and raise an army to defend against events such as pirate attacks. Two things pushed Hamilton's idea forward. One, he was able to convince George Washington, the most popular person in the United States, to endorse this idea and come out of retirement to help push it through. And two, a farmer by the name of Daniel Shea staged a rebellion in the name of economic injustices. Because the U.S. lacked a national military, they struggled to squash the rebellion and had to rely on private militias. This coupled with a lack of money for civil services and quarreling amongst the states, meant that the Articles had to change. Finally, in 1787, at the Annapolis Convention, each state sent a representative to fix the weak country. Eventually, they would rewrite the United States and create a strong executive office with presidential powers, balanced by a new legislative branch that included a Senate and House of Representatives, and rework the powers of the judicial arm it would become what we know as the Constitution. See, in a strange way, we wouldn't have the Constitution if it wasn't for the failed Articles of Confederation. The years right after the Revolutionary War were a trying time for the United States. The world was full of monarchies, and here was the upstart former colonies forging ahead with a government that hadn't existed since the Roman Republic 2,000 years prior. And initially they failed. But more importantly... They saw their mistake and fixed it. When you think of the Articles of Confederation, think of a pendulum. On the far right of that pendulum, you have monarchies. For centuries, the United States had been governed by an English king or queen. After the war, they went in the opposite direction and swung to the far left of that pendulum and formed a government with no discernible leader. But ultimately, the failure of the Articles of Confederation caused that pendulum to swing one more time. This time, it would not be as extreme. It would hang right in the middle, and the U.S. would form the Constitution, write the Bill of Rights, and elect George Washington as their first president.